Hello, we are starting with um, Nana Bible study, and we're in Mark 10, uh, verse 46, the story of blind Bartimaeus. And uh, our projector isn't projecting, and so you'll just see me, but I will um, uh, try to make sure that you hear the rest of the room. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead, Doug. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then he rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man. Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Thank you. So know that what I want you to look at, first of all, is what stories these verses are sandwiched between. Well, right before we've got the request of James and John, oh, let, let us sit next to you on your throne. Yeah, the request of James and John, let us sit next to you on, when you're on your throne. So there's a little blindness there, right? Yep. And then what is coming right after? Oh, the triumphal entry, right? So the Jesus, this is Jesus on his way to the cross. Yeah. So he'll be on the cross by the end of the week. And let's talk about what happens on the cross for a minute. So we know, obviously, that, that he is killed on the cross, but why does that? Why why did Jesus have to go on the cross? To be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. To be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. What happens on the cross? John, the book of John especially uh, talks about this. This is where Jesus is in his glory, right? This is where he is in his what? glory. Oh, okay. This is where he is his most godness is on the cross. It's the it's that opposite. You know, we, we hear this opposites all the time that the last are first and the first are last. Yeah. And so in his absolute humility is when his glory shines. So... That's one thing. What happens to us when he's on the cross? We're forgiven. We are forgiven. It's the happy exchange, right? So he takes on and wears and becomes our sin. And we take on and wear and become his righteousness, right? Happy exchange. This is gonna be helpful when we get into the Romans verse two. Okay, so, so James and John absolutely do not get it. They, you know, they know that he's the Messiah, but for him, their Messiah is more of a political Messiah. He's gonna defeat the Romans and um, set up the kingdom Okay, sure, it's the kingdom of God, but it's still going to be a kingdom in human terms that, that they are relating to. Well, the whole concept is pretty complicated. I could see why it would be hard for them to grasp, you know, what, what are you talking about? I can see that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I suppose too that it's, you know, we know and we have hindsight yeah. when we when we read these verses. And so we're like, you know, come on, yeah. you know, he he's God and he's been saying it all along, you know, yeah. and he's gonna deliver us from sin, which is what the Messiah means, right? That's the um, the anointed one that's going to deliver us and that's what they're that's what they're looking for us messiah means anointed one and uh you know in the in the um he's going to be the davidic they call it the davidic messiah and david you know king david was a warrior king he fought for his people and um that's what they want right so Here's blind Bartimaeus, and he comes and he, he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So he gets the Davidic Messiah part, son of David. But what's he ask for? What does he ask for first? Forgiveness. Well, I don't know. Let's see. I have to mercy again. Mercy. Oh, mercy. He asks for mercy. Yeah right? Have mercy on me. So he's seeing something different about the kind of deliverance that this Messiah is going to give, right? Different from what the people that are looking for a political Messiah. So have mercy on me is the first thing. So if you're asking for mercy, what you have to recognize something about yourself that you're in need of mercy, right? I mean, that's kind of basic, but, um, you know, he recognizes he needs mercy. He's, do, you, do you think that that fits with the fact that often at that time period, they often thought that if um, that it was their sin that caused them to have a defect or a problem? Yeah, that it was sickness. And, I, I think exactly. Yeah, um, in the in, in the first century if you were of a lower station for any reason because of your health or because of the um, fact of your birth, like if you were born into poverty or um, whatever the situation was, it was your sin that caused that so to happen. you think he thought because he was blind, he had done something wrong? Is that what you're thinking? Mm -hmm. Or his parents had. Yeah. Remember the other story about the blind man? What did your parents do oh, to make yeah, you blind? Yeah. So there was sin involved in his blindness and his in his mind and in the cultural, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And even in Roman, uh, you know, Roman civilization, there was a connotation that if you were of a high station, you were blessed. You know, there was some sort of blessing that you had. Um, I think people still kind of believe I that. think they I do, yeah. Sort of yeah, I think so. Yeah, the theology of glory, you know. I know when my brother had developed cerebral palsy, my parents thought it was something they had done wrong. Yeah. I mean, I think they grew out of that thinking. But, right. But that was, I think we still kind of think that. What did I do wrong to deserve this? Yeah. What did I do wrong that my son has cerebral palsy? Yeah. Hi, Marco. Marco just joined us. Yeah. Hey, Marco. Uh, yeah. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm here. You're here. Okay. <laughs> well, it's good that you're here. Um, I'm having my usual, you know, nothing goes 100% right when I'm on Zoom. Um, I just got a new laptop and I can't figure out how to hook it up to the projector. And so I'm going to translate for the, for the um, group that's here. <clears throat> and um, I think if you say hello, they can probably hear you. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 There you go. You got that. All right. Oh, so quite a group too. Hmm? There's quite a group. It sounded like there that. is. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We got um, Doug and Barb. We've got Ross and Carrie. We've got Linda and Teresa, and Loretta. And we're kind of loud. And they're being really unruly today. So maybe <laughs> maybe you can help me. Okay. All right. Um. So we are in Mark chapter 10. We started with verse 46, the story of blind Bartimaeus. And we're just making some distinctions between, uh, you know, we're, this story is kind of sandwiched between James and John asking to sit at the right hand of Jesus when he's in his glory. 
and um, the triumphal entry where, you know, Jesus goes into Jerusalem and he's seven days from his death. Okay. So that's kind of where we are. And um, so one thing that was interesting, I thought about uh, this story too, is he's Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. And I don't know if this means anything. I looked up Timaeus and I, I don't know that we know anything about him, but his name means honorable in Greek. Oh, what does Bartimaeus mean? Um, son of oh, Timaeus. So Bar is son. Oh, oh, okay. and, uh -huh. okay. Yeah, okay. so Bartimaeus means son of the honorable. Oh, okay. So I don't know if that is coincidence or if that's meaningful. Yeah. So, so he, he has heard a lot about this Jesus because when he heard that he's there, he, you know, obviously knows that there's something this, this Jesus can give him this mercy that he's crying out for. Right. So, um, yeah, he's son of David. Yeah. At least. Yeah. yeah. I, I think if he, but if, assuming that he thought that his, his blindness was caused by something he did or his, his, his father did or his parents, he, he asked for mercy, but he doesn't ask for his sins to be forgiven. He asked for his, he asked to have his, he asked to have his eyesight. So he's, to me, he's worried more about seeing than he is about his soul. Well, he doesn't initially ask for his eyesight, though. He initially asks for mercy. Yeah, please let me see. Well, is that what he's asking for? He does, he does later when Jesus drills down, they go to the next level and says what, you know, he says, what do you specifically want me to do for you? But initially he's asking for mercy. And, you know, in the, did, did you hear what Ross said? Okay, good. Um, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, um, you know that word that Pastor Bill uses all the time, chesed, it means loving kindness in, in the Old Testament. And so, um, uh, um, and it's the word that Pastor Jonathan said that the kids call aspectrance, or no, yeah, chesed. That, is that right? Is that the aspectrance word? Where you have fear? Oh no, that's fear of God is the aspect of his word. Whatever you say, we'll but, believe you. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Whatever you say, we'll believe no, you. No, I'm lying. Know. I'm lying. Because it's it, this is something different. So as Chesed, said, this is this loving kindness of God. It's the the mercy that, that only God can have for people. Um the loving kindness, the grace, the all of these words. And so in the Greek they call it mercy. So I think that would have been one connotation of um, of this guy, if he understands that it's Jesus, you know, if he understands that Jesus is more than this Davidic Messiah, which I kind of think he does, you know, I think he's, he's blind, but I think he sees way more than James and John do. Obviously he's heard about Jesus. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So he might be asking for mercy from his sins, forgiveness of his sins. You know, like we do, the word for mercy is eleison. We do that curia eleison, you know, Lord have mercy. Um, Could restoring his sight also mean he's wanting more of a insight into Jesus? I mean, could it have a double meaning? Sure, maybe, yeah. In, in the story, like, I'm blind and now I see as meaning more understanding. Could, maybe. I yeah. Was yeah. I don't know. I don't think we can, you know, I, I, I don't think that, that the text overtly says that, but the text doesn't overtly say a lot of the things that we've been talking about. Yeah. yeah. Other places it refers to sight as, mm -hmm. yeah, more, as understanding. More understanding. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. In, but in the house where they lowered the paralyzed man down. Yeah. Jesus said, is it easier to have him walk or to forgive his sins? Yeah. So he said, told him to walk. So I'm assuming that the blind man to see, he's also in that same moment forgiving his sin. 
I believe so. Well, and especially when we look at the at, when we look at the last verse, he says uh, in verse fifty two, he says, "Go away, your faith has made you well." And that word for made you well yeah. is sozo in Greek, and that's also the word for salvation. Yes. So you could read this two ways: your faith has saved you, and your faith has made you well. So that is a really good point. And he seems to be further along than his disciples right there. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. James and John are the blind ones, and this guy is seeming to, you know, to really get it. Yeah. So, so why, do you, I mean, I don't understand why the people would rebuke him, telling him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. I think it has to do with him calling him the son of David. Because that, that promise given to David a long time ago, that the Messiah would come from his line. Mm -hmm. And maybe the, they didn't want people to uh, realize that this was the Messiah. Okay, so maybe sort of a, so what Carrie said, you didn't hear that, did you, Marco? So Carrie said, maybe they're trying to silence him because they don't want the people to know that he's the Davidic Messiah. So I, I missed some of this because I wasn't here for the first three. Are they saying the reason why he's blind is because of sins of his parents? Well, that was sort of the um, that was sort of the first century thought about a low station in life. Like if you were economically disadvantaged or if you had a physical disability, it was because of something that you or your ancestors had done to to put you in that situation and that was uh that was roman thought too and greek thought that there was you know it was like blessed you were blessed if you were doing well and um it was a curse if you had something like this happen to you and today we don't believe that at all right <laughs> no well so, um the point was made that a lot of people do believe that or sometimes it is something we do if you're an alcoholic you're going to give birth to a baby with fetal alcohol syndrome yeah you've done something to cause that disability sure you know i mean it, we do do stuff that causes disabilities we sin yeah well we do we just do stuff i mean if you don't keep obstacles off the floor of your house and you stumble over something and fall you've done something sure there's cause, cause and effect with you you heard that right as I just fell when I was on the train a week ago. Oh no! Oh, you sinner! You sinner! <laughs> no, it's the train that, people that, that sin by signing it that way. That that's the the thought of someone sinning to cause them to be blind has uh, really hit home with my daughter having gone blind in the last few years. Yeah, as a fifty year old. Yeah. And that has come up as like, well, what did you do to cause that? Well, exactly. Yeah. It well, and, you did. and we would call that horse hockey because that is looking for a theology of glory rather than a theology of the cross. Right. So if you only see God in the good things, you see God in the beauty of creation and you see God in healing and you see God in. Um, the fact that you've been blessed with a good job and, and a, you know, a good retirement plan and all of this, if that's the only place that you see God, then when you have, you become blind or you get cancer or you get pneumonia three times and yeah. can't breathe, oh. <laughs> you know, then you despair. But right. Cause then you ask yourself, what did I do? Do I not have enough faith? I mean, that's the that's something that people hear all the time. Well, just have faith. Just try to have a little bit more faith and it'll be okay. That is the worst. Th I mean, I think that's the worst thing you can say to somebody. When bad things happen to me, I can identify with Jesus because I think, look at all the bad stuff that happened to him and how he suffered and everything. I'm suffering like he suffered. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, sure it does. Sure it does. Yeah. Well, um, that's what they say too, is that like in our baptism, we are born and we we die into Jesus' death. Yes. And then when we come out of the water, we're raised to Jesus' resurrection. Yes. Right? That's that happy exchange. Yeah. 
telling somebody they don't have enough faith is like telling somebody they're not doing enough good works. Exactly. Telling somebody that they don't have enough faith is like telling them they don't do enough good it's works. It's not our place to pass that judgment. It's not our place, it's first of all. To, to, it's not our place. That's it's not. Not at all. No. And I think people, honestly, the people that say that, I've heard wonderful, loving people say that yeah. and people from my own family yeah. and they honestly think that they are healthy yeah just don't know what else to say they don't know what else to say gotta, gotta say something and so what would be the better thing to say if you're struggling like that you don't have to say anything you just give them a hug and you don't have to say them. anything that's that is a good response and that's um you guys are going to do job next i guess in um your thursday morning bible study Abigail, Jonah. 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 Oh, he was considering the two. Oh, okay. Jonah. All right. Oh, oh, oh. Well, Job would have been a challenge. Yeah. Shoot, because I love Job. When, but... I, when I suggested Job, I was actually joking. <laughs> but the best, the best thing that his seven friends, you know, when they came to comfort him, best things that they did, or not seven friends, it was three friends that stayed for seven days, right? <laughs> They said nothing. They just sat with him for that time. They were just in um, solidarity with him and in his pain. You can say, God is with you in your pain. You know, you're not alone in this. God feels your pain, you know, um, and it may or not may not be helpful to the person. I don't know. But if you're feeling the absence of God, because you are struggling with something than to have that promise that God is with you in that struggle, you know, I think it's really powerful. So, so Bartimaeus isn't having it though. They're telling him to shut up and he cries out all the more son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called, so they called the blind man and they said, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. Now, what do your Bible say um, for take heart? What what are some other translations? Cheer up. Cheer up. It's kind of wishy-washy, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's in the real Bible, it says. Be of good comfort. Be of good comfort. Okay. And then Bartimaeus says, where is he? Because <laughs> he can't see. Because he can't see. <laughs> 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 and I do doesn't say that, but <laughs> Sorry, you guys. Up on your feet. He's you, and he jumps up and comes to Jesus. How often have you seen blind people just jump up and run? I was struggling with that. Yeah, Jesus. Know where to go? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Jump up with faith. Yeah. <laughs> so, does anybody else have something besides take heart? Take heart, get up, he is calling you. Yeah. So he um, sprang up and came to Jesus after throwing off his cloak. He just rise in the robes. Yeah. Um, there, another word, here, let me think of my password here before I start talking because I can't do two things at once. Another um, translation is um, be courageous. Uh, uh, yeah, be courageous get up he's calling you so he throws off his cloak and he springs up and he comes to jesus and jesus says what do you want me to do for you now you'd think it would be obvious right yes same question exact question that um he asked what james and john right? oh my gosh yes exact same, exact same question for james and john i didn't catch that so where is that in james and john um, what do you 36? want me to do for you? There it is. It's in 36. I think that the Lord asked them. Yeah. It is. Marco, what was that? I think it's necessary for us to verbalize what we want and just not just assume that, that he understands because that means we have thought from our heart what we're trying to um, communicate or yeah. ask for. What do you want? What's in your heart? Right. Did you guys hear that? Yeah. Okay. Also, have you ever, I mean, 
I get overwhelmed and it's like, I don't know what I want. Yeah. You know, what do I need? I don't really know. Do I need a nap? Do I need a snack? Do I need a hug? Do I, you know? <laughs> um, and the other thing that's comforting to me, and I use this verse all the time. In fact, I used it this morning in our prayer that the Holy Spirit knows what we want, right? And the Holy Spirit will intercede for us with God and right. and it's, pray for us. But our purpose in prayer uh -huh. is not so much because we need to tell God, teach God something. God already knows. Right. It's for our It's for our benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And sometimes what we want is the Holy Spirit says, no way, Jose. Well, that's it. Sometimes what we want is a, is a nap and the Holy Spirit's like, no, no you right. need... <laughs> Yeah. No, you don't need all those chocolate bars. <laughs> yeah. So so I wonder if if the if Bartimaeus when he says, you know, I he wants he he wants to recover a sight. And I I didn't get a chance to really look into this, but I thought it was interesting the way he says this. Let me recover my sight. Does Ross, does the real Bible say anything different? Lord, that I might receive my sight. Lord, that I might receive my sight. It seems like that would be, I would expect the question to be more like that rather than let me recover my sight. You know, I it just seems kind of a weird turn of phrase. Mine says, let me see again. Let me see again. Yeah. Do you see the difference between, I mean, and I, so I don't know if that's just an idiom or um if there's any meaning there, like I said, I didn't have a chance to look into it, but I just thought that was a little bit strange. So the way he said it, it's like Jesus had been preventing him from seeing. Uh huh. Yeah. Or, or from, from getting his sight. Yeah. And that's not. Well, the other thing that this says is that he had been able to see it one time, right? If he's recovering oh, his again, sight. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. That meant that he could see at one point. Let's see again. Yeah, so what did he do wrong to lose his sight? Yeah, what did he do yeah. wrong to lose his sight? <laughs> and um, uh, let's see, let me get here, Mark. I think blind Bartimaeus would be a good name for an indie rock group. <laughs> <laughs> An indie rock group named Blind Bartimaeus, a Christian, group, Christian rock group. Yeah, um, so he calls him rabbi, so teacher, but he calls him, the, if you look in my app, I can look and see what that word is. It's Rabboni, and that's a more personal, that's my teacher. My teacher. Let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go on your way, your faith has made you well and he said that often he in mark he you know the um the doesn't he say that to the woman with the hemorrhage and he says that to um is the centurion's child is that in mark two your faith has made you well doesn't matter where it is but he says that all the time your faith has made you well you know or your faith has made your child well and immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now, the other thing that I thought was interesting is that if you translate take heart to be courageous, then he followed him on his way. You would need to have some courage to, to do that, right? And following on the way, that's what they used to call the Christian movement was the way. So I, I think that's interesting too. And King James says in the way. In the way. I think it's kind of funny that Jesus tells him to go. He doesn't go. He follows Jesus. He follows him. Yeah. Go your way. Well, my way is your way, Jesus. So let's get going. And I think just says go. So oh mine says go your way. That, that makes that would make sense. Yeah. yeah. So that always. so that then says that you you have to have strong enough faith to see again, so that that substantiates the fact of well you don't have enough faith. That's why you're not going to have your sight restored. Yeah, but we don't see. It doesn't say how much. It, he just says your faith has made you well, but he's also elsewhere said all you need is a mustard seed. 
So we don't know that he had this huge enduring faith or if he's grasping at straws, you know, at the last straw. I mean, it sounds like maybe he does have faith. He's, you know, he throws off his cloak and stands up. But I don't think Jesus is saying that this faith has to be a huge faith. I, I think he's just saying faith. But, but, but he says your faith has made you well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> would be his faith was strong enough that made him well. So if a person prays for something to to restore whatever sight and doesn't have enough faith, then that substantiates the fact that, well, you don't have enough faith, so that's why you're not healed. Oh, I know. I'm stretching. Well, I'm I think it's too close to home. <laughs> yeah, but, but there have been so many other places where people have little faith and good things happen to them too, you know? And I think we, this is a real, we'll get into this when we look at the Romans text. Um, in fact, let's just look at the, the punchline in Romans. Um, um, it's the last verse. You don't have to go there. But it says, for we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. So a person is justified by faith. So that makes it sound like it's your faith that justifies you, but it's your faith in Christ. It's Christ that justifies you. And you, that is received through faith. And that can be received through, received through any quantity of faith, any, any little kernel of faith, because you get that in your baptism. That's the, that's the faith that's, that is gifted to you in your baptism. And is an infant going to have great faith? You know, they have, I think they have this, kernel of faith that's given to them and then of course the faith grows through word and through sacrament and through you know um jesus will will build this faith but i, I just don't i just don't think that i mean i'll tell you what if i believe help my unbelief is my motto really because if it counts on the amount of faith i have I'm lost. You don't have to have faith the size of a giant pumpkin. I don't have to have faith the size of a giant pumpkin. I mean, that would put me into such despair. I, I mean, that I, it's truly, and that's what I thought. That's what I thought before we started coming here, yeah. is I thought that it was based on me. It was based on my if I could have a relationship with Jesus, if I could have enough faith, because I wasn't understanding anything. I didn't have enough faith to understand everything, obviously. You know, I, I felt terrible. I love that verse. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Yeah. I, that's a good verse. That is a good I'm verse. I'm not sure where it is, but I remember the verse. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, Marco. I just, I have a, I just think that we can get ourselves into such such despair by relying on our on the quality of our faith. You know, it's not what we do; it's what God. Does. I think it's what what Jesus has Jesus. already done. Yeah, He did it. He accomplished it. It's not what we do. It's yeah, our acts. We don't earn our way into anything like that. Yeah, God. yeah. yeah long journey you put one foot in front of the other yeah and if you're walking with jesus you're just putting one foot in front of the other that's all you can. you're not superman and gonna do the whole thing you just right now i'm walking with jesus it's the way yeah. you're walking yeah. on the way right yeah it's with you. you may not feel like it but yeah. you're doing it that's all we can do yeah Yeah. Well, what else about Bartimaeus before we move on to? So he followed him on his way, on the way, and the way is to the cross. Right? I just am curious as to then what the disciples' reaction to all of that was. And it doesn't tell us, but I kind of wondered, you know, okay, well, now what do we do with this? Just... No, he's at it again. Yeah. He's at it. He did it again. Oops, he did it again. Yeah. Yeah, because they've seen this over and over and over yeah. again. 
and they have this little faith. I know. You know? They're trying to protect him because everybody wants a piece of Jesus. Everybody wants yeah. to talk to him, touch him. And they're trying to and of conserve course his they don't want to see him killed. They don't want that. Yeah. yeah. That would be a terrible thing for them to want. So Yeah, he had to rebuke Peter because Peter proclaimed him to be the son of God. And then Jesus said, well, you know, I have to die. And Peter's like, no. <laughs> yeah, and I don't blame him. Yeah. You know, he yeah, Jesus. he loved Jesus. Yeah. Well, we don't like that Jesus had to die. There's a lot of people. In fact, there's a lot of modern theologians that think that this, um, you know, we, uh, God said, or God, Doug said that, um, Jesus was the, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Doug said that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. And there are a lot of modern people that think that that is, you know, like it's the divine child abuse theory. You know, why would God wow, I didn't know that. have, yeah, why would God have to kill his own son? That's a, you know, that's a brutal thought. It's just they can't. It, well, it was God dying. Jesus was God. Yeah, God died God's self, right? Yeah. It wasn't like he killed his three-year-old, you know, he, he killed himself. He killed himself. Mm -hmm. He became that final sacrifice. Yeah. 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 Marco, did you want to say any more about that? I hope I didn't totally just cut you off about that faith thing. No, no. I'm I'm too tired. What's that? I think I'm through talking. Thanks. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I probably messed that up. Um, well, if there's nothing else on that, let's go ahead and go to Romans. So do you all, uh, we've heard this story quite a few times, but I don't know, maybe all of us haven't, but do you know the story of Luther and how this verse came to be sort of the pivotal change for him? This verse? Uh -huh. <laughs> the, the, um, for we hold that a person is justified Go by faith apart from works of the law. Okay, well, I'll tell you. If you've heard it again, I'm sorry. It's 20, right? Is that the one here? Yeah, 28. 20. We hold that a person is justified well, by faith. In the Catholic Church at the time, you do all these things to earn your way into heaven. And Jesus didn't subscribe to that. I mean, Luther didn't subscribe to that. Yeah. Yeah, I actually learned a little bit more about this. Um, Marco, did you have a background? Were you Catholic? Um, no, I was raised uh, in the Zurich Center Lutheran. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, Ross, you were Catholic. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I learned last semester that the real importance of the of the um, sacraments, of the seven sacraments, was to put someone in a state of grace so that the work that they did actually counted. So you have to go to confession and receive that absolution so that then when the penance that you do counts, or the good that you do, you know, you feed the poor or whatever. Well, the, the, the absolution doesn't kick in until you do the penance. Mm -hmm. 
but also like if you ha if you have this if you take the sacrament of holy communion then you're in a state of grace and so that the good work that you do during that time except because that's what distinguishes the good work that a non-believer would do from a good work that a believer would do. Well that that's what that's what was it Paul Paul says that too, isn't it? Or Luther says that if you don't if 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 you don't do things because you want to do them for the Lord, then you're you're not you're not doing them right. Well or I'd like to see that verse in context. I'm, I'll 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 look that up. I was a Catholic for about 16 years, and I don't remember quite hearing what you just said quite that way. Did, I, did you? Learn, I don't remember learning what you Yeah, just let said. me go find my source. I'll have to go find my source, yeah, but maybe, that's what they... Maybe the interpretation has changed since I am no longer Catholic. Yeah. But that's not what I learned when I became a Catholic. I just learned the importance of the seven sacraments. And, but I don't know. So what what did you say? What was the um? If, how did you say it? If you don't if you don't do the good works because you're doing them for the Lord because you because like Luther says you 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 do those good works because you want to because you're saved by grace. Right? If you don't do them that way, then you might as well not even do it because they don't they, they they don't come. In fact, they're bad for you. And it kind of talks about that in the book about the faith of the glory the versus the faith of the cross. Yeah. Um, is that the filthy rags for at first? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. All right. Well, we won't go too far down that path. It doesn't really matter. Um, it, it doesn't really matter anyway for what we're talking about. But so um, Luther had, what is the, what is the psychological disorder where you have these thoughts, these constant thoughts that um, where you think you have to be better, you're not good enough, you think you have to be better? I guess the Luther syndrome. It is the Luther syndrome, that's right. But there's a, there's a, there's a term for that where you, it's like a compulsion that you just... You just go over and over and over in your mind. Obsessive compulsive disorder. No, it's um. What? Like ADHD. Yeah, yeah, there's there's some term for it, but that you just beat yourself up. But he was like that. He was that. That's it. He was like that. He just beat himself up like for complex. huh? A martyr complex. Yeah, he beat yeah. himself up for the things that he felt like were sins, and he. He came to realize. He absolutely drove his confessor crazy. His confessor had to tell him, get over yourself. You know, you're because he would spend hours in the confessional really? over things like, oh, I spilled my Cheerios on the floor, or you know, um and then he would go back later and say, I forgot this. I yeah, yeah. I not only spilled my Cheerios, but then I left a little pile of milk. I didn't clean them up, I didn't clean them up right or something, you know, and he would just perseverate over that. Um, God, I wish I could think of the word, but anyway, he Luthered it. Yeah. So he had this, he just was, he knew the Bible so well, and he was just, um, you know, he'd read the stuff and it would just kill him. It would just kill him because he didn't have enough faith. If, if he only had a little, you know, or he didn't believe enough or he, he had to be forgiven. He believed in absolution. And so he had to get that absolution all the time, you know. And so when he read this this final verse, he was up in a tent. They call it the Tower Experience. He was he was reading it, and um, it said, "For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works, just prescribed by the law, and and it's not by the quality of your faith." It's by faith in Christ. So Christ is really the focus. So we hold that a person is justified by, the, by their faith in Christ and what Christ has done on the cross apart from works of the law. And that was his light bulb. That just snapped him and freed him. 
Yeah. So uh, somebody read this. Yeah. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human beings will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. Righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are more, they are now per, uh, justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by His blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes a boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. And we hold that a person is justified by faith, apart from works prescribed by the law. For is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one, and he will justify the circumcised on the ground of faith, and the uncircumcised through the same faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means, on the contrary, we uphold the law. But she didn't get all the way to verse 38. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, I, I wrote a note to Kathleen. <laughs> yeah, I wrote a note to Kathleen. Here's a, um, here's a little write-up about the tower experience. So this happened two years after he posted the 95 theses. So he had he was already seeing the need for reform. He posted these 95 theses and he was writing, um, he was doing a study on the book of Psalms, which is just beautiful. If you ever find that study, it's really a, um, really a good one. But um, it says, I meditated night and day on those words until at last by the mercy of God, I paid attention to their context. And he, he, it says, he says, the justice of God is revealed in it. As it is written, the just person lives by faith. And that word just, um, Pastor Bill's talked about this. Um, it's, um, it's the same word. If you look at um, the word righteous, it's the same word as the word justified or just. And so you, we can't say that somebody was righteous in English, we say they're justified, but it's the same, it's basically the same word. So justification is is to be made righteous, right? Yeah. Okay. So he says, <clears throat> um, the just person lives by faith. Okay, so the righteous person lives by faith. I began to understand that in this verse, the justice of God is that by which the just person lives by a gift of God. That is by faith. I began to understand that this verse means that the justice of God is revealed through the gospel, but it is a passive justice, which I mean that by which the merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, the just person lives by faith. All at once, I felt that I had been born again and entered into paradise itself through open gates. Immediately, I saw the whole of scripture in a different light. I ran through the scriptures from memory and found other terms that had analogous meanings. For example, the work of God, that is what God works in us, the power of God, by which he makes us powerful, the wisdom of God, by which he makes us wise, the strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God. I exalted this sweetest word of mine, the justice of God, 
with as much love as before I had hated it with hate. And because he was, he felt like the justice of God was to condemn a sinner and he was a sinner, right? This phrase of Paul was for me, the very gate of paradise. Um, let's see. He just goes on to say that Augustine had said kind of the same thing, but he was an Augustinian monk. But he said, although Augustine had said it imperfectly and did not explain in detail how God imputes his justice to us, still it pleased me that he taught the justice of God by which we're justified. So so, um, yeah, so this was key. So let's, I wanted to go back because he talks about um, this um, sacrifice of atonement by his blood effective through faith. I wanted to go back to that sacrifice of atonement. Do you, do you guys remember where that comes from? And you're referring to verse 25? Uh, yeah. So that was part of Levitical law, right? There were all kinds of um, different kinds of sacrifices that you had to do for different kinds of sin. So, so there was blood sacrifice and there was grain offerings. There was grape offerings. There was, um, there's a whole table of different kinds of offerings for different kinds of offenses. Um, and so the blood sacrifice is for the very worst yeah. sins right um and th then on the day of atonement yom kippur they would go and sacrifice in the temple to cover everybody's mm -hmm. sin right so um the leviticus 17 says the life of the flesh is in the blood and i have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement the life so, so in this, you know, uh, there are a lot of different atonement theories, but in this, in this atonement theory, it's got to be a blood sacrifice that makes the atonement, okay, that makes you, that redeems you, that justifies you, that puts you in good stead, right, with God. And so Jesus fulfills that requirement with his own sacrifice, right? The other thing is verse 21. I just want to go through a few of these words. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. Does anybody have a different word for disclosed in their Bibles? Righteousness of God has been what? Manifested. Manifested. Made known. Made known. Does anybody have anything different? So manifested is, I, I take this as put in flesh, right? And um, we know from scripture too that Jesus is the perfect manifestation of God, right? We only know God through Jesus. So it was Jesus and his humanity that manifested the righteousness of God, right? This righteousness was put into a body that we could see. And I think that's important. So, and it's attested to by the law and the prophets. So Christ fulfilled the law and the prophets, right? The righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ. It could also, does, does your Bible say faith of Jesus Christ or faith in Jesus Christ? In. in, yeah. So you can read this that, that you can read this in two ways. Faith in Christ or, or Jesus' faith is actually the thing that does this work for you. Right? You can read that two ways. Um, so again, verse 24, they are now justified by his grace as a gift, 
you can also read that as they are now made righteous by his grace as a gift, because that word justified and righteous is the same, is the same word. Um, we just talked about sacrifice of atonement. Oh, this was interesting because in his design, divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. So blood was important in that first, in that, um, in Exodus too, right? And getting the, and saving the people from Pharaoh, from slavery, is they had to make a blood sacrifice of a lamb and put it on the lintel. And then the angel of death passed over. So I think that's a, that's an important observation. Okay, so I've talked way enough here. How what um how does this how does this land for you? What does verse twenty seven? What is boasting? Mean? Where, where, where does that come? Well, I thought with all the laws. So yeah. surely I'm better than you are. <laughs> Posting is that, right? Saying how great you are. And he says, it's okay. He's basically saying it's okay to boast in what Jesus has done. You know? I'm, I've been reading the book about the cross versus glory. Uh -huh. And it's kind of a, addresses that. It's not, if, if we do a lot of cool, good things and things that's going to earn us something, we're wrong. And that's kind of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve said, we don't need God. We're perfectly capable of doing all this stuff on our own. I, I kind of see a relationship there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not what we do that earns us anything. If we, if we, boy, that's cool. I really did that. Right. It's all, it's all what Jesus did. Yeah. And what? they do through us through us in our faith walk yeah and then really it's the holy spirit doing those things it's, right. it's christ who's given us the holy spirit that does anything that works right. and that's who gets the credit mm -hmm. that's right not us exactly which i battle with a lot because sometimes i think i did a really cool job on something without really thinking well yeah but you know i had help yeah i don't know my off base no i don't think so yeah. What else? We got 25 minutes, so. <laughs> the last verse, 31, is kind of interesting. Yeah. So do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. So why do we uphold this? Why do we? So what, what is the purpose of the law for us? Mm -hmm. it shows us where we messed up. That's right. It shows us why we need Jesus. So there's two, there's two purposes of the law in Lutheran theology. Well, actually, some people say there's three, but there's two purposes. What's so so to keep us to to show us our sin yeah. is one purpose. Do you know yeah. what the other purpose is? Show us why we need Jesus because we can't be perfect. It it keeps it, it it's like a social it, it's the it's the it's social order. It's the thing that makes non believers be basically good people too. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, it, right. Shows us moral laws. It keeps us in line. It curbs and it's there's a there's a, a moral order that you have to follow. Is this talking about government laws too, mm -hmm. or like you know? And we do render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar unto God. The things mm -hmm. that we are, we do have to. Oh, we, we can't go ninety miles an hour in a thirty-five mile zone. Right. You know? Right. I mean, some people do, but well, and a lot of those you could map to the Ten Commandments. No, you. No, no, no. <laughs> A lot of those you can map to the Ten Commandments: "Thou shalt not kill." Well, you there know? you are. Yeah. yeah. But they're all kind of interrelated. Uh -huh. Yeah, we you know pay taxes because then that goes to taking care of the poor, yes. and it goes toward you know. Yeah. Yeah. So to curb sin and to show our sin. Yeah. 
kind of two purposes of the law. Yeah, there's scripture where it says, Jesus says he came to uphold the law. Right? Oh, to fulfill. Fulfill. Thank you. That's the word. Mm -hmm. Fulfill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not to abolish it. How old was Luther when he made all these changes in his thinking? So let's see if this was about 1517. Um, he was born in the late 1400s, I think. <coughs> Excuse me. Fourteen eighty three. So, fourteen eighty three would have Very made cool. him. Well, let's see. Twenty. Seventeen, seventeen, thirty four. Yeah. Do the math, Ross. I'm a Spanish major. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty quick. Yes. Trienta y cuatro. Trienta y cuatro. Okay, he's 34. Gracias. He was 34 years old. Gracias. <laughs> that surprised me. No, it doesn't revolt. 34. That's not very old. Uh-uh. Wow. I was expecting you to say 60 or so. Yeah. Well, this, I mean, this happened. So he, he was a professor, right? So he had to have gone to... Yeah. He, he had to have gone to... All the, all the school. That's amazing. Yeah, and he was working at the university teaching, so he's writing this yeah. thing on the Psalms that is like a, one of his seminal works. And wow. yeah. What a life expectancy was. What was life expectancy back then? Forty or fifty? Or... Yeah, I think it was pretty low. I mean, he yeah. lived into his sixties, mm -hmm. but. Dying all the time. Mm -hmm. He wasn't always a well man. I think I almost died a couple times. Mm -hmm. But in a while since his wife grew bare and, and that cured him. That probably <laughs> it was probably better to drink the beer than the water. <laughs> Here's a fun interesting note on verse 28 footnote here. Okay, 28 no, so. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Footnote says about by faith. When Luther translated this passage, he added the word alone. alone. Yeah. So faith alone. Mm -hmm. Which, though not in the Greek, accurately reflects the meaning. So, oh, really? Lutherans like to say faith alone. <clears throat> faith alone, yeah. Well, there was the, the so five solas of the Reformation. Sola means alone. Yeah. Right? So faith alone, Christ alone, faith alone. Uh, yeah, let me look them up. I should know these. I'm a terrible seminary student. Okay, faith alone, the glory of God alone, grace alone, Christ alone, and scripture alone. Yeah. I saw some of that on a stained glass window for sleepers. Mm -hmm. not, not all five, I think it's just like three. Yeah, um, I don't know why. Sometimes they say there's three solos and sometimes they say there's five. Found in the side windows, they made a mistake in, in the lettering. And then the world alone. The world alone. Oh, that's a bad <laughs> mistake, isn't it? Where is that? Yeah. Yeah, that's a bad mistake. Is it still like that? I think so. Wow. 
It's a good teaching opportunity, I suppose. Well, I don't want to keep us just for the sake of staying until noon if we're done. Um, do you have, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about with this or? I could just add a fun little story. Please. Because um, it's, uh, and I plan to tell this to Pastor Bill, but it has to do with a study of Jonah coming up. Okay, so um, we've, Lots of years, we really loved going to Holden Village for a week mm -hmm. in the summer. And so in the summer of 2019, when we were there, uh, they pretty much always had uh, a pastor from somewhere do a Bible study uh, each morning during the week mm -hmm. for an hour or so. And so in that year, 2019, there was a pastor from, let's see, it was Northern Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland, I guess I, sometimes I forget if it was Ireland or Northern Ireland. It was a Methodist yeah. pastor who was um, who was invited to come yeah. and um, do the Bible study for for the couple of weeks there. So we were there for a week, and he did study on Jonah. Okay. Okay. It's uh, you can get through it in a, in you know five days of study. It's only what four or five chapters. So it'll take Pastor Bill a year or so to get through it. <laughs> yeah, that, I was going to make a joke about that too. But, uh, but my point of this story was that uh, fun thing, this Methodist pastor had a good sense of humor. There was, uh, it was maybe for the third or fourth, probably the third day, probably a little bit about the third day of the uh, five days worth of studying through. And um, instead of him being there in the room where we met when we came in, he was absent uh, for, you know, beforehand. And he didn't come in until right at the time that it was supposed to start. And as he walked in, his shirt was all soaking wet and he had, had um, seaweed. seaweed wrapped <laughs> around his neck. Okay. Sputtering. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Like, what does that what does that tell you about Jonah? He he bit in the fish. Out, he spit out he of the fish. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. Oh. That was hilarious. He did sense of humor. He really loved that. So I guess I got to ask Pastor Bill if he's willing to. Uh, <laughs> he probably would. <laughs> he majored in drama. That pastor. Yeah. He'd probably do it. That's yeah. what he did. He would. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> gotten a lot of um, enjoyment out of going to Holden Village. Yeah. Do you still do that then? Yeah. Yep. We had to miss two years because the year right after that, uh, they were, it was really closed down because of COVID. Yes. And then the summer after that, they asked that only people that worked um, over a certain age you know, like 60, 60 or 65, or people that were immune compromised, okay. you know, not come. No so we had, miss, so we had to miss two years because yeah. we were too old. Well, yeah. you, you'll have lots to share. Yeah. 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 Looking yeah. forward yeah. to yeah. hearing yeah. your yeah. insights yeah. from what you learned. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry about your sister. Oh, thank you. Is, is the funeral already there? That's this weekend. Where is that? Seattle. Is she your younger sister? Yeah, yeah, you're younger. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you have anything to add? I was hoping you'd start over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a chance. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you. We're gonna um, we're gonna finish a little bit early today. Have a quick closing prayer. Okay. Go ahead. Bingo. Yeah. yeah. Let's be the formula.
Has anybody ever been the foreman of a jury before? Ever been what? Yeah. Ever what? That, that's how they pick the foreman of the jury. The first person says anything about that's the right. foreman. That's right. That's right. Lord, thank you for this time that we've had to, to, to share that studying in your word. We thank you for this time. And would you go with us this coming week? As we go through our times. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Okay, Marco. Yeah. All right. Okay, we're going to sign off now. Over 18 years. <laughs>